Welcome everybody to a lecture on game theory. I'd like to share with you some of the work we've done at UC Berkeley. My name is Dan Garcia. I'm a teaching professor and I want to share with you my undergraduate research and development group called Games Crafters. You can see from the slide here that the talk is going to be about solving the world's board games with computational game theory and that's really cool. So I always start with the computing in the news and every lecture I ever give and the computing in the news that we're going to talk about today is that checkers, a very popular game people play all the time. People play on their porches in the south. They just play and they take chick, 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 and you see people jumping over. You know, a lot of the, they have these in movies where the, you know, the, the little child prodigy goes chick, 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 and steals all the pieces or something. That game I used to play as a kid has been solved. And that means... And by the way, it's been weekly solved. I'll tell you what that means a little later, but weekly solved, I'll just stop. I'll tell you right now. Weekly solved means that they know if two perfect players played, who would win? And the answer is nobody. It'd be a draw. Isn't that amazing? That, and, and, but, that, but, but because the word weekly means that if you were to play it and go down to some particular game, they may not actually know what the, what, whether that game is good or bad because they use a technique that prunes the game tree to reduce how much work they have to do because they took 19 years to weekly solve it. And that's amazing. So that is an incredible uh, amount, amount of work that people have put into to, to, to get that working. And it's, it's just remarkable how successful they were in doing that. 19 years, many of you, I don't know, maybe 19, 19 years old. And so now can you imagine 19 years working on a project and finishing it? So that's the news of the day. If you then went away to tell your friends, I attended a lecture by this professor, Dan Garcia Berkeley in game theory. Well, your friends may ask you what, what kind of game theory? It's almost like you go to the Star Trek computer, you say, I want T, Earl Grey. The computer may respond by saying hot or cold because it's kind of an option. So there are multiple different families of game theory and I wanna make sure you know which one you're doing. Right here on the left is combinatorial game theory. And that game theory is two people playing together and the goal is always to get the last move. In that game, we have complete information, which means both players know all there is to know about the world. They alternate moves. And the goal in all of those games is to get the last move. All the way you see here on, uh, move it over here, on that way, all the way on your right, is economic game theory. And economic game theory is what they award Nobel prizes for. If you ever sold a house um, and you have people put in silent bids for who thinks they're gonna put in more money for the house, that's something called economic game theory. If you've heard of the prisoner's dilemma, that's economic game theory. If you ever played rock, paper, scissors, rock, paper, scissors, shoot, oh, rock beats scissors. That's economic game theory. The idea is to win at all costs, with I mean, not all costs, by any means necessary. The goal is to win and the goal is to win uh, within the rules of the game, um, but you often make simultaneous moves or incomplete information. I don't know what, it's, you know, it's not a simultaneous, you know, you put your bid in here, but it's a closed bid. I put my closed bid in here for this house and it's not simultaneous, but I don't know what you did. You don't know what I did. So, you know, for you know, all intents and purposes, that was simultaneous. So all those games are um, economic game theory. We actually consider the game in the middle, which is we want to be able to solve combinatorial games, but also games that aren't combinatorial, games like tic-tac-toe, connect four, um, chess. Some of these games are really big, you know, go. Those games are too big, but what we'll do is we'll actually solve a smaller version of that. And so we do that by computer horsepower. We put the game into the system, we let the system solve it by walking through all the, all the possible moves and, and, and positions that you'd see in the game. And you eventually have a winner, a loser, a tie, maybe you draw, maybe, maybe you draw play forever, maybe it's a tie. But the game, at the end of the game, it isn't always about getting the last move. You know, in chess, it's about capturing the king. In Connect Four, it's about getting four in a row. So it could, the end could be anything. So the, the, the end could be anything, and, and the goal does vary. So it's more general than combinatorial games. So we can solve combinatorial games, um, but they can't solve many of our games because they only consider games where it's the last move that wins. What board games do you mean, Dan? I mean, I, mean, I, I know about a lot of board games. Uh, I, I, example, I play cards, I play poker. Is that what you mean? Well, no. Um, the games that we consider in our group are games that have no chance. Um, that means there's no dice. 
no shuffled cards, no randomness in that system. Both players have complete information. And what that means is both players know all there is to know about the game. There's nothing that's hidden from that. Um, there's a game called Stratego where I have an army and it's hidden and you have an army, it's hidden. And our, our, we can't see each other's armies. So I don't know if this is the king or that's the spy. Or, and so that's a game where we do take turns and there is no chance, but because I can't see your army, I'm kind of probabilistically guessing where your pieces are and not really playing with complete information. However, if, if you took Stratego and tipped it down, so all the, fa all the pieces are face up, so that all pieces can see, all players can see what that is, well, then that's certainly a, a, a reasonable game that we could solve. Two players, we call them left or right, red and blue. Um, often, you, you have to take turns. Um, you usually alternate moves. And when I say, I thought you said, Dan, you have to alternate moves. Well, you do, except that sometimes you can have a repeat move. In the game of Reversi or Othello, there's a time where you can't move and it's the other turn's play, person's turn to play again. So they'll make two moves in a row. So you can have a repeat move or a skip move. So you can skip one person so that the other person would repeat. If you've ever played Dots and Boxes, that's actually a combinatorial game theory game. And the, wish, the goal is to get a higher score than the other person. So we consider that a combinatorial aspect as well, because you consider the score to be the number of free moves you're getting for another game. Um, but in, in, in Dots and Boxes, if I make a box, I get to move again. So again, that's a game where you could have a, a repeat move and the other person would be skipped for that term. Um, you can never have simultaneous moves. You can't have players go one, two, three, go, and make a move because that's something that's only economic game theory handles. And the game can end any way, a pattern, a capture, by an absence of moves or any way. I wanna show you a video and I hope the AV of this works. We tried this out in a second ago. This is from the movie War Games and it's a 1983 movie with Matthew Broderick in which he's a young kid. <clears throat> he was a child actor at the time and he, um, accidentally hacks into um, a computer system. Uh, um, it's a, a, a military computer. He doesn't mean to do anything bad, but he ends up setting off a chain of events where the machine that he haps into, just for fun, just to play around, um, it's called the Whopper, like the Burger King Whopper, W-O-P-R. And the Whopper is going to try to break into another military computer, so two computers, this Whopper, evil one, gets, goes evil, goes rogue, and tries to break into this other computer that holds the secret. This holds the secret keys to launch nuclear missiles to end the world, okay, or to you know, bomb the bad guys. So back in the movie, the bad guys, certainly. So this bad computer, this, this, this kind of crazy run amok computer is trying to hack into this. And so as you're seeing the movie and hearing the phrase, it's got the code, it's gonna launch, it's got three digits. It has, I think, 10 digits of the code and has to break in to get all 10 digits. And when it gets all 10 digits, it'll then, it's like trying all the possible combinations. When it gets all 10 digits, it has the codes. So what we're gonna watch is him trying to convince the computer that in the game of global thermonuclear war, it's called war games, nobody wins. And he wants to teach it that, he wants to do kind of machine learning, he wants to teach it that by having it play tic-tac-toe and having it extrapolate, think about you know, using some data and then conclude something beyond what the data shows. So extrapolate that playing global thermonuclear war or playing real thermonuclear war is also a bad idea because nobody can win anyway, okay? So I'm gonna show you this movie and I'll cross my fingers. This is called The War Games and this is the ending. And this is on YouTube, you can find this by Googling War Games ending. Let's see if this works. Try this out here on my microphone and go. Put X in the center square. Yeah. Okay, I hope this is working. Six up. There's no way you can win that game. I know that. It doesn't. It hasn't learned. Is there any way to make it play itself? Yes, number of players zero. So now it's making it play itself. So this is what we do. We play tic-tac-toe against ourselves. And watch what's happening. It makes a move and it keeps trying. That didn't work. That worked. That didn't work. And there's the code it's trying to hack, okay? Learn, goddammit. Okay, sorry for the salty language. It's trying to solve every possible game against itself. Look how beautiful this is. And that's the Whopper. So that whenever they show those lights, that's the evil Whopper. Eight. And it's learning. More and, more power from the rest of the and it's actually learning right now. 
that's it. This is what we're doing. Now, now it gets into more of the movie, and you don't need to know this. But watch, it's doing exactly that, and that's the idea. See, now it's firing up the missiles, but it's learning, and it then concludes, maybe I should do a simulation. Oh, and that overrides the computer, and then it overloads, and it's a big explosion. Okay. I hope you can hear that. So that was an attempt to try to show you a little bit of that video from War Games. And that's how we do it. We play every possible game against ourselves. And then we try to extract what the value is of that game. So let me actually tell you a little bit of math. This is a little bit of math to explain how this system works. And I'll use my cursor here to describe it. So we always assume alternating play. You know, there are games that, as I mentioned before, you can have it, it, it play, um, have one person make two moves in a row, but this isn't there. We're always assuming if I make a move on this particular game, just to simplify it for, for tutorial purposes, then it's always gonna be your turn. If it's always your turn to make a move, it's gonna be my turn next. We consider the value as a very egocentric thing, meaning the value is always for the player whose turn it is. Not, you could either think of, this is the value for the left player always, or this is the value of the right player always. We say, well, whoever's turn it is, they're looking at the game, is it good or bad to them? So what we first will talk about, there are four different values we consider, a winning position, a losing position, a tie position, or a draw position. Just so you know, circles are positions. So these are positions. This would be my turn, and then I'd make a move, and then it'd be your turn. And the, the arrows are the moves. So arrows are actions or moves, and circles are positions, or like a board. If I take a photograph of a board, we call that a position, okay? So here's how this works. You are defined, this is by the way, what we call a recursive definition, which means it's defined based on itself. So winning positions are defined based on losing positions and winning. Losing is defined on winning, ties are defined on, so all this goes on for, as a, in kind of an infinite loop of definition. And at the end of the game, there has to be some position that's over, the game is over, and we call that the kind of the starting point. And then all of a sudden, blah, 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 the logic kind of bubbles up from there in a beautiful way. So a winning position is defined as one in which there exists a winning move. Now, I'm gonna show you some colors here. Green is for winning, like a green light, like good. Red is for losing, stop, a bad thing. And yellow is for tying. And tying says, you know, it's halfway between, which is like a, a yellow light. It's like halfway between a red, and a, a red and, a, and a green. So you're a green, good, winning position, means you could win, happy, if there exists, this symbol is there exists, if there exists a losing child, remember we're always alternating play. Losing child means I'm gonna make a good move. I could, if there exists a move I could make, giving you a losing position. We call these kind of parents up here and children, like a tree, almost like a family tree. So when I say losing child, I mean there's a circle below in which this is a winning position and below is a losing position. Similarly, a losing position is one in which all children are winning. It says, I'm a losing position if all of my moves are bad and all of the resulting positions, meaning the position for the other person, would be a win for them. So I'm a lose if every option to me is bad. A tie position is one in which, well, I tried to find a winning move, meaning a losing child, I couldn't find that. But I do have a tie child. And it's better to give you a tie than to give you a win. See, these are bad moves. Boop, boop, boop. These are bad moves. But tie is not that bad. So I'll go for the tie move to give you a tie position. This comes in the game like tic-tac-toe. And a draw position is one. So this is here. Tie says that does not exist a losing child, but there does exist a tying child. A draw says I can't be forced a win or be forced to lose. So I can't force a win on you, which is what I want to do. That means there's no green win, winning moves available. I can't make a good move. There are some bad moves that are down here that yield kind of the game being decided, but it's not so interesting. But actually, I, I can make a move so that I move into another draw position. So that's kind of neat. So I can't force a win or be forced to lose, but I can kind of stay up here in the draw cloud. We call it being in the clouds. So I'm in the draw cloud and they'll just live in the draw clouds until somebody makes a move that descends them down to earth. Every move from a draw position down to earth is always a losing move by definition. If you're winning, then it wouldn't be in the clouds. Only way you could get draws if you have nothing but draws that keep you in the clouds and nothing but losing moves that descend you from the clouds. So 
That's the idea. You kind of descend from heaven into earth, and that's always a bad thing because it's better in heaven. And uh, then the other player will have a winning move and can win the game. So you never want to make a move off of a draw if you can help it. You, you can, you know, the best thing you can do a draw is stay in a draw. Um, we also keep track of remoteness, which is how long before the game ends. We, want, we care about, you know, does this game end for, does the game go on forever, that there'll be an infinite remoteness, or can I guarantee a win um, in two moves? And that would mean that this win saying it's a remoteness of two means that I can make one move, giving you a losing position, and whatever you do, you have no way to extend the game. Because usually winning players want to win the game as fast as possible, and losing players want to extend the game as po long as possible. So that's how, we, that's how we define remoteness, is the losing positions try to make the longest possible path. If I, you know, here's this losing value, uh, losing value of a position, and let's say it's children positions have remoteness 10, 20, 30, 40, well, then my value is 41. It's the longest way I could possibly do it plus one because I have to make one move to get there, 41. If I have, these are 10, 20, 30, and this is 40. Well, these are all bad moves. I don't want that. I want to get to the good ones. And if, oh, if I have several winning moves, let's say as a 10, 20, 30, 40. So let's say 40, maybe a 50, maybe a 60. Well, what's my value? It's the smallest of the winning moves. So I don't count these guys. These are terrible moves. It is the best possible move I can make. These are all good winning moves if I had three of them. And it's the shortest possible move. So it'd be 41. Okay, so it'd be 41 for that. And tie is a little ambiguous what we do. We basically say ties want to finish the game as fast as possible. Otherwise, ties end up being hugely long numbers because both players be maximizing. So if both players want to minimize it, you get to a nice kind of stable state there. All right. Now, this is a weird way to do this um, conference, to do this webinar, because every other time I've done this, it's when been face-to-face -face people or on a webinar where there are people with me in the room. But what we're doing this is we're kind of pre-recording this. So I can't really have the feedback that I normally have, and that makes it hard to give. So what I'm going to do is actually teach you this game and then ask you to pause the video and play with somebody, a brother, a sister, a cousin, a parent. Think about how you could play this game. So let me tell you how to strong, strongly solve this game and how to play it. The game is called 10 to 0 by 1 or 2. How this works, you are going to place 10 coins on the table. And on the turn, you take either one or two coins and you put it in your pocket. You don't care how many you have. It's not like getting the most coins is how you win. You just take one or two off the table. And so then you're, or put them back in the main pile, put them, give them away, whatever you do, but take them off the table. The goal is to be the last to move. You're going to say, aha, this is a combinatorial game. Cause you, Dan, you said at the beginning, combinatorial games are last to move wins. And in fact, you're right. This is a combinatorial game, but we can solve those two. I mentioned we can solve those two. We're going to solve this one. So here's an example game. So there's 10 on the board and Anna and Bob are playing and Anna says, I'm going to take two to make it eight. You can, by the way, you could also take, play this over the phone or like in the back seat of a car without a piece of paper or without coins. You just say, I'm going to take two to make it eight. Now it's eight. Bob thinks and says, oh, I'll take one to make it seven. And there's a picture on the right of an example of seven ducks there lined up in a row. And it says, okay, seven. Interesting. I'll take two to make it five. Bob says, I'll take two to make it three. So now it's three. And it says, well, I'll take, two. I'll take one to make it two. Bob says, I'll take two to make it zero. And Bob wins. And the reason we strongly solve this is we want to ask a question. We want to ask, did Bob play perfectly? Like Anna went first, right? It was 10 and it was Anna's turn, but Bob won. So I want to ask you, is this the case that it was a losing position initially and then they both played perfectly? Anna making what is only available to her are losing moves. Bob having only a winning position, only winning moves and only made the winning move. Or is it the case that Anna should have won, but actually fumbled the ball at some point? You know, she was running the ball toward her goal and fumbled the ball. And so what I want you to do is pause this game, play with a friend, pause the movie, i sorry, play the game with a friend, play it twice, play it 10 times, at least go first once, and at least go first, go second once, so you're, you're the second player, and then see what you think and try to deduce what you, what, how, how to play this game, okay? And I'll pause the video. I'll pause so that you can pause the video and we'll come back. Welcome back. Thank you for pausing the video. Let's see if we can solve this together in our heads. Okay. First of all, we ask ourselves, what is 10? 
is 10 a winning position or a losing position? Well, you say, Dan, the game is over. And I say, okay, great. If I'm a 10, did I win or did I lose? Well, let's think about it. The goal is the last to move. So if there's only one duck on the table and my opponent had it, my opponent was at nine, makes a move to 10, and my opponent actually, let's see if we can get this right, my opponent actually wins that game. And in fact, I am gonna see if I can do this. There's a way for me to set this up. Let me, let me just do it for a second. You're gonna lose, I think I'll block some of this, but if I, if I do this in a full screen, okay, and I do this, I think I get access to a mouse. And I'm gonna do this here. I hope you can still see me. I've been, I'm trying this new here. Hope you can see, see this here. And I can now have access to the pen. Let me see, here's a pen here. Oh, here we go, pen. Okay, pen. And I can change the pen color and make it white. Okay, let me go back here to this, perfect. Okay, now we can solve this together. I hope, I hope by the way, this is still coming through in the video. I, I'm looking on the side, I think, I think we're good here. So let's do this. So watch this, I write 10 and I write nine and nine leads to 10. Ah, blah, 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 blah. Start, start, start. Can, can you start over, Dan? Yes, okay. Zero, one leads to zero. And I've got two. And two has two moves. I got a, a move to one and a move to zero. I got a three. And we're gonna see if we can actually see a pattern. And three goes to two, but three also, it's right here, goes to one. Now I got a four. See how I draw this? I kind of draw like a little ladder here. Four can go to three or four can go to two. I got a five. Five can go to four and five. You say like, Dan, get, get with it. Okay, well, let's see if we can go. And by the way, we solved this from bottom up. Okay. I'll just give six and see if you can see a pattern from six. Okay, I'll do one more. Six can go to four. Oh, I actually drawn the bottom, but that's uh, okay. I'm gonna stop at six and see if you can guess it to see the pattern. All right, now, if I go to the bottom, I think I can change my color. Let's see if I can make it red. Okay, if I'm at one and I make the last move, I've won the game. Remember, like the last move wins. If you make that last arrow, you've won, which means zero is a losing position, okay? I'm gonna change it now to green. Let's see if I can get this working. Okay, well, that means this was a winning move. Look at that. And if it's a winning move, then one, is a winning position. I can even actually maybe draw the line itself. Two, same idea. If I've got the existence of a winning move, then I am a winning position. Now, how about two to one? Do you remember this slide? Let's go back a slide. Look at this. Oh, good. It doesn't erase it. How about a win? How about a win to a win? Remember this? Win here. If I'm here and I, I make a move to another win, <gasps> That's a losing move. We call that a fumble. I was supposed to win the game. This is, Dan, just cross the goal line. Can you please just run the ball across? Nope, I didn't do it. I fumbled the ball. So any two to one, win to win is a losing position. So now pull up some reds here. We're going to see this is sorry, a losing move. I said the wrong word. A losing move. And in fact, let's look at three. Three has a child that's winning. Three has a child that's winning. And that's all the moves there are. If you have a move where all your children are winning, then you're in a losing, and color this, like a losing moves available. And if all the moves are losing, you are in a losing position. Look at this, okay? And now we've kind of repeated. Look, zero was a lose and three is a lose. And if your goal is to get to zero, your goal is now to get to three and maybe you can start to see the pattern. This is actually really cool. Watch this. Well, if three is losing, then four is winning, five is winning. The move from five to three, a winning move. When to lose? From four to three, a winning move. Okay. What's left? Watch how I, this is exactly repeat of what I just did now. Six has two winning children, just like three had two winning children. If you got only winning children, then you are a lose, and all of your moves are losing moves. That's a lose, and that's a lose. And in fact, look at this. The move from five to four was a, was a, a fumble. Five to three is the move to make. So five to four is a fumble. How about four to two? Win to win. 
another fumble, and we have now color-coded the whole thing. Now, what's the value of 10 then? 10 red? Is it red? Is it green? Can you see the pattern? Question mark. Look at the pattern. Let's, let's do it here. I even had them both, all three on the top. I, mean, I, I think I actually, in my back of my mind, I was doing this on purpose. Zero, lose. Go back three, lose. Go back three, lose. I'm going to pause. See if you can figure out what I'm going to say next. Exactly right. Go back three, nine is a losing position for the exact same reason. And by the way, the reason it goes back three is because if I can only make a one or a two move, I can't universally go from three to zero. If I could, I would win, right? If this said one, two, or three, well, then folks, this is a different game. But because it's not or three, it's just one or two, with three, I can't move immediately to zero, otherwise it would be a win. And in exactly two moves, if I say one, if I say one to two, you say two to zero. If I say two to one, you say one to zero. So in fact, you, you play perfectly so that between your move and my move, it always adds to three. So if there's three, coin, three ducks on the table, whether I'm taking one, you're taking two, you're taking two, I'm taking one, we're getting three bucks. We basically got three ducks. And if I'm going first there, you always get the last duck, right? If I take two, you take one, you got the last duck. If I take one, you take two, you got the last duck. So three is a losing move. It's bad to have three. Same reason six, bad to have six. And you can play the game to six to three in the same way. If I say, if I take one, you take two. Now it's three. If I take two, if I take two, this is, if you take one, you take two. If I take one, you take, so if I take two, you take one. So either way, you're giving me, if I have six, you're giving me a three, you're giving me a zero. So if I have a nine, I'm going to lose, which means, let's go to my colors again here. And it means now that just like you're guessing, just like you're guessing, 10 is a win. Look at this. Okay. And the winning move is to get to nine. So the way to play this perfectly, which is pretty cool, go first. Here, there's three things. One, go first. Okay. First, that's it. Okay. First, comma, say one. Say, I was literally just a couple of things. Say one. And then two, to win. I'm drawing this in green, to win always. To literally win always. What's the title of this talk? Never lose again. So in order to never lose this game again, go first, say one, and then always go opposite. If they say one, you say two. If they say two, you say one. If as a result of saying opposite, what's going to happen is you and your opponent are always going to take three away. And it's, you'll be the one to take the next three. They take one, you take two. Then they got six. They take two, you take one. Then they got three. They take two, you take one. Then they've, they've got zero. They've lost. You made the last move. That's it. Look at this. In three words, I've summarized this perfect play in this game. And in fact, not just that, you'll never lose this again. I, I want to emphasize the never. You can, in fact, you cannot lose this. Even if you wanted to lose, if you follow this algorithm, you couldn't lose. <laughs> Even if I'm hoping not to win this game, let's say I'm playing against somebody who I bet to lose, you can't. This guarantees a win every single time. Pretty cool. So now think about this. What if I change this rather to be 10 to zero by one or two, made this 100 to zero by one or two? Does anything change? Think about that. This is multiples of three, right? Zero, three, six, nine. What's the closest multiple of three to 100? 99. How would you get to 99? Take one. Same logic. How about 1,000? Guess what? 999 is the first, is the losing position you want to get to. Same one. Works for 999. Works for 99. It works for 10. I mean, it works for 10. Works for 100. Works for 1,000. Works for any multiple, any, not multiple, but any power of 10. Pretty cool. So that is a, a, game, a game where we use this strategy, this logic, all of this logic for defining what these games are. We used it manually to solve this game. So now I want to show you a cool demo. I'm going to get out of this slideshow mode here if I can. And whoops, discard my annotations. That's fine. And I want to show you, if I can, give me a second, it'll, it'll resync. Okay. I want to show you our system. We built a system to play this perfectly. 
if you don't know the game of tic-tac-toe, how the game of tic-tac-toe works is you, actually, maybe if I do this, I, I can even set up the slideshow and put this in the individual window and then it'll keep it here. Okay, and I'll go here and start the slideshow. All right, boop, okay. To get tic-tac-toe, the goal is you have a, a three by three grid. Your goal is to get three in a row. Most people play this. If you don't know, I'm trying to teach you. Um, on an empty square, you can't ever put, if someone grabs a square, you can't grab it on top of them. And if you make a three in a row first, this is like, and this could be any row, column, or diagonal, then you win. First point to make three in a row wins. Otherwise, if the board is full, then, and nobody has a three in a row, that's a tie. So X went first. And I then color code using our moves, the value of the move. We call this value moves. So it's X's turn. X, X, it's my turn because it's three X's and three O's. Therefore, it's X's turn because X went first. <gasps> Watch this. X can win going here. Yoink. So this is green. If X goes here, red. So X just goes on the side. You know, it's like the side. Why would X do that? Why wouldn't it win? Well, it's kind of silly. It goes over here. Maybe it's pen moved or something. Then O says bloop, bloop, and puts one here, and it loses, and O wins. Therefore, X loses. Therefore, this is a losing move for X. Remember, it's always egocentric. It's always from the person's turn. It's X's turn. Therefore, it's X to lose here. X moves here to win. X moves here to lose. If X moves here, we call this a tie. Why? Because X blocks O, bloop, bloop. O blocks X, shoop, and then X goes here, bloop, bloop, and nobody wins. So that's a tie. So this pretty picture shows you why, how to use this visualization to think about this game, okay? Now, I wanna teach you another game called Misère Tic-Tac-Toe. Misère is a French word in the game theory vernacular. It means the opposite. Whatever the rules of the game were to win, what's the opposite? Whatever the rules of the game were to lose, it's the opposite. So here, I would say three in a row wins. Well, misère is the opposite. Three in a row loses, okay? I would love you to stop the video. Again, this is hard, easy to do on a face-to-face -face workshop or a face-to-face -face session, but hard to do virtually. I want you to pause the video and go find a friend, a family member, a neighbor, cousin, and play misère tic-tac-toe. Go. And welcome back. And so now I'm going to play misère tic-tac-toe. And I don't know what you thought. I usually kind of now interview the audience. Did you think it's a winning game, meaning it's a first player win? Is it a losing game, first player lose? Is it a tie game, first player, meaning, meaning if two perfect players played, what would be the value? It says, is it a tie? Or is it a draw? You're gonna say, well, Dan, it's not a draw because draw means you play forever and this game ends in nine moves. You're right, it's not a draw. Here's a fifth option or fourth, fifth option. Does it not matter what you do going first? Only matters at the end. And some students actually choose that. But if you've been paying attention, it always matters. It's never fuzzy. Um, it's only in draw positions does it not matter, okay? Because you could just move in the draw area until you finally watch out about descending from heaven. So you could have a position where all the moves available to our draws. But it basically will move matter to, to somebody in some case. And by the way, this game could be one it could be a game in which X is favored so much it actually doesn't matter what X does because all of them are wins. And O, because they're all wins, O has only loses. So you could have a game that's so favored one player that they only have wins. That's kind of a unique case, not the case here. So let's play it. I'm going to play against our computer. Let's try it. Here we go. Bloop. I, let's play X. It's playing here. Remember, I'm trying to avoid three in a row. So I'm going to go here. I'll go here. Try to like not get three in a row. Okay, I'm trying to avoid it. Oh, I don't want it, so I'm going to go here. I'm kind of, none of these make three in a row. That's kind of cool. Um, how about here? Oh, boy, look at this. If I go here, it's right through the middle. That's not so good. So let me undo this. That wasn't so good. Okay. What if I went here? Let's go there. That's better. Okay. Now, uh-oh. Now it's making me on the side thing. That's not so good. Wah, wah. What if I went, okay, let me go in the middle now. That's the secret. And nope, now it's along the diagonal. Wah, wah. Okay, well, maybe that wasn't so good. Maybe I'll play a different, maybe I'll play a different one. Maybe I'll go here. Oh, this is better now. Now I got it, okay. I don't want to go down here. That's okay. I'll just go in the middle. That'd be fine here. And then it, uh-oh, wah, wah, got to go there. Let me back it up. This is getting hard. Oh, this is the move I should have gone. And it, it uh-oh, wah, wah. I'm kind of stuck. I don't have an answer. I have no way to do this. So let me go back and make a new game and refresh it. 
what should I do? Is it, was I stuck in a losing position? Did I just not fight? Was there a way out? Let's actually do this. You remember I, I, I do. Here's, here's the, watch. There's my answer. I'm giving you the answer to Mazer Tic-Tac-Toe in which it's a tie game. If I ask for predictions, it'll say Dan should tie in nine. That's pretty good. And by the way, I usually play against my team called Games Crafters. So my group is called Games Crafters. I usually play against them when I play these games. So it remembers my name. Well, the only way to keep the tie is in the middle. And let's see what happens. I go in the middle. And now I have to go kind of geometrically opposite. You remember before it was the only way to keep it to, to win the game was go first, say one, and then go opposite. Here, to keep best practice to win the game, I go middle and then go opposite. Isn't that fascinating that go opposite seems to be, now here's two ways, but if I continue to have this, I can go opposite. I continue to have this idea that I can win by just go, I mean, sorry, tie by going opposite. And if I undo and choose another, that was a side move here. What if I did an undo, and there's a little error here, I have to kind of sometimes redo this thing here. Okay, what if I go here? What if it goes on the edge? Yeah, now, notice, again, opposite. Look at this. Notice only take way to keep the tie is opposite. This particular way, there's only one way to do it. Look at this. And it's opposite. How about that? Okay. So this is another game that we've solved and you will never lose this one again. That's why we call it never lose again. For tie games, the best you can do is tie and you're never losing it. If this game were a first person lose, the way you never lose again is you go second. So you still need to know the value of it. And you just to say, you just defer to the other person. I said, thank you so much after you. No, 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 after you. No, after you. No, 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 after you. No, after you. Now, let me just show you something interesting. If I show you this, this graph and I show that there's a kind of a yellow in the middle, right? Well, let me make this so that so two players, human versus human. What if I were to go in the upper right? Now that's going on a losing move. The other person should win. Games crafters should win. So that means there should be green circles available to me because if I can win, there better be winning moves. And these are the winning moves. Okay, let's think about that. If these are the winning moves, how can I remember this? And, you know, and, if, I, and if you happen to, and if I choose one of them, you're going to have only loses. That's how the game works, right? All reds. And then let's say you choose here. And I need to somehow memorize what all my winning moves are. Okay. It was, so here's a fascinating thing. Okay. So watch this. Ready? I have visualized, we did a, what's called a fractal or recursive geometry, and we visualized this picture. So remember, the game was a tie game. So I draw an outer square as yellow, meaning a tie game. Then, do you remember the first position, like the beginning position? Only the middle was yellow, it was red everywhere else. So I draw squares to indicate that this means that only the yellow has a tie and everybody else has red. Do you remember how I moved into the top right? And if I do that, do you remember that inside there, once I moved to the top right, there were these eight remaining pictures. And you remember there were these greens were the greens that were available. So if I do this for every possible position, I get this pretty picture. Remember when I moved to the right? If I moved to the right, the greens were on the top left edge and the bottom left edge, bottom and the bottom corner, but opposite, kind of opposite this. Again, it's kind of opposite. It's like if, if I move the top right, the way you keep your win is you go kind of diametrically opposite. It's opposite both in geometry and opposite in kind of style of moves. If I moved it, if, if, if you moved into the corner, then I'm going to go opposite corner, opposite from the corner is an edge, and opposite geometrically is this edge, not this edge. Well, they all work, but it's opposite edge. If you go in this edge, I go opposite in both geometry and the type. So if you go in this edge, I want to go in a corner and away from this geometrically, which is this corner. And guess what? That's the response. So we have actually printed this out as, as hilarious as a answer key. This is a tic-tac-toe answer key, and I'll share that with the leads of the session. If you want to download this answer key, you can have the answer key to tic-tac-toe as a gift from me to you for thanking you to come to this talk. We've also solved Connect Four. Connect Four was one of the most amazing 
largest games that people play. I mean, people play Connect Four all the time. Here's two ladies playing it on the, oh, you see on the right. The, we, when we visualize that, it is a winning move. It's a winning position and the winning move is right in the middle. If you go to the sides, so like slots three and four in the middle, if you number these one through seven, four in the middle is the winning move. The neighbors are ties and the ones in the corners are losing. Isn't that cool to visualize the value of Connect Four and you can play this online in our system. I have a group called Games Crafters. Our website is gamescrafters.berkeley.edu. It's a playoff of the name of Lens Crafters. The idea was Lens Crafters, we make lenses in less than an hour. Games Crafters, we can make a game in less than an hour. We can't actually, but that was the joke. We solve games in less than an hour. It's my undergraduate computational game theory research group. We, we average 20 students a semester. We've had 400 students since 2001. They usually work in teams of two. So if you're around Berkeley, come talk to me and see if you can join my Games Crafters group. It's a research group, kind of taught like a class. You have to join, you have to join for the beginning of the semester. Um, it's wonderful. Um, most students return and take senior roles. We have 70 games of puzzle system. We strongly solve them. Remember, weekly solving means you go down the, the, the path, but you don't actually visit every possible uh, position. We do. We go, we do what's called a British Museum search. We visit everybody and we do that. Here's our logo of, this is, uh, this is our two colors for Cal, the yellow and blue. And uh, Ox, Oski is the name of our uh, mascot. This is Oxy, like O-X, like Oxy. This is our mascot with the Games Crafters base below. So in future, board games are exponential. And so, but so has the progress and speed and capacity of computers. But because they kind of cancel each other out, every few years, we only get to solve one more ply. One by one, we're gonna solve them and all beat all humans. And they've done remarkably well with that. Um, and they have now beat Even if we were to solve the game, we would have nowhere to store it. Even if we wrote, wrote the answer of every possible value of every possible Go combination on every atom, very small pen, very, very small pen, and you wrote it on the side of every atom, there wouldn't be enough atoms to write uh, all of the values of this. So Go will never be strongly solved. It'll be strongly solved for small end games. You know, maybe there's like two moves left or on a small board, like nine by nine or five by five, we can do that. But certainly 19 by 19 is far too big to solve. That's it. That's my group. That's my research. It's called Games Crafters. I've taught you a couple of games here. I've taught you 10 to zero by one or two. I've taught you Misere Tic-Tac-Toe. I taught you how to play them perfectly. You certainly want to go first in both of those games. Go first in 10 to zero by one or two. Go first in tic uh, Misere Tic-Tac-Toe or let them go first and don't let them go in the middle. That's another fun game. If you actually play that game, that's really fun. Uh, let them go first on Misere Tic-Tac-Toe. They can't go in the middle. They can't grab that tie. Now they are forced to lose. Now the game becomes a losing game because there's no more ways out. You have only losing moves left and therefore you could win. So let them go first, have some fun and you can play each other letting one person be kind of the, you know, the fall person, the fall guy and moving first. And then that move person moves first will lose if played perfectly. The second player should always win. Okay. Thank you so much for coming folks. Great to see you. My name is Dan Garcia and I approve this message.